Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about the element phosphorus. Phosphorus is element number 15 on the periodic table. Phosphorus has various types of allotropes and combines in various different forms. And here is an example of phosphorus, P4, it's white phosphorus. The reason it's very reactive is due to its inability to bond with itself. In this form, it has four atoms of phosphorus, one, two, three, four, and they're bonded in this pyramid-like shape. And that makes white phosphorus very reactive. We're going to get into that and its properties in just a second. And we're going to talk about its uses, applications, history, and dangers. Here is an allotrope of phosphorus that we're going to talk about. Red phosphorus exists in a polymeric chain of tetrahedral structured P4 molecules in which one of these double P4 bonds are broken to enable the linking of these tetrahedrons. Each phosphorus atom in P4 is linked to three other phosphorus atoms in a tetrahedral structure. Here's a previous version. It was a more triangular like molecule with a triangle at the bottom. This one on the other hand is just one, two, three, four. It's just four atoms of phosphorus. Five were bonded before and these individual ones are bonded to each other and that's what creates red phosphorus. We're going to get into that as well. We're going to talk about phosphorus's properties and how it bonds to create phosphoric acid, which is demonstrated here. But we're also going to talk about how phosphorus is related to nitrogen in various ways. pH3 is similar to the molecule NH3, which creates ammonia. So pH3, phosphine gas, is simply an ammonia version of phosphorus, just a little bit more dense, heavier, and more energetic in terms of mass, not in terms of energy, in terms of having having momentum relative to other elements. So here is phosphorus. Like anything intriguing, I'm hard to pin down. I'm a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde element, essential to live, yet wicked dangerous at the same time. A chameleon that appears in black, red, and white. I play a pivotal part in the DNA structure and in the body, but I can be deadly. My white form ignites in air and even burns underwater. I can inflict terrible burns, and sadly, I was used for that purpose in World War II. I'm a central element in sarin, a lethal nerve gas that has been used in a number of terrorist attacks, unfortunately. Arguably, my most important use is in fertilizers. I am also used in many foods as phosphoric acid and acidifying agent. You can find me in any bottle of cola, which is why you can use this soft drink as a rust remover. So if you have any rust on anything, you can use coke or any type of soda to remove the rust. So that is the general preview of phosphorus. Let's get into it. Phosphorus forms various oxides, especially with the element oxygen and chlorine. Because they're oxidizers, they take the electrons from the phosphate. Phosphorus has five valence electrons, which which bind or are transferred to halides or oxidizers such as oxygen. Here they form oxides. Here we can see P4O6 or P4O10, P2O5, P4O10. And these are just examples of the oxides that form with phosphorus. Other such compounds are things such as phosphates. Phosphates are presented as one phosphorus bound to four other oxygen. So phosphorus, how is phosphorus produced today and what is it used for in today's day and age? So apart from being used by our body in various ways and functions, such as in the blood, such as in the bones, such as in our teeth, it's also used for various things such as in the manufacture of steel. It's also used to synthesize various types of products that are used for example, rat poison. It is often used as a rodenticide. ZN3P2 is a semiconductor with a direct band gap of 1.5 electron volts and may have applications in photovoltaic cells. So apart from being used in its potential for rat poison, it's also used in semiconductors in PNP junctions or in PN junctions such as in photovoltaic cells. Another word for that is simply solar cells or solar panels. They're used in that in the similar way that arsenic or phosphorus as previously mentioned has five valence electrons. We previously mentioned them in the boron episode because we mentioned how boron is doped along with the silicon and then in contrast the phosphorus is doped along with the silicon due to silicon having four valence electrons, boron having three valence electrons, and phosphorus having five valence electrons. That relative difference of valence electrons creates differences in energies which allows them to be placed in things such as photovoltaic cells which allows us to use them to create and transfer electricity via the photovoltaic process that takes place when we create and sandwich those PNP junctions together which simply have the element phosphorus or the element arsenic which we will eventually talk about thanks to their five valence electrons which allow potential in electricity to form and eventually electricity to be utilized. So zinc phosphide is used for photovoltaics as well. Here we have the formula 
ZN3P2, and it's similarly bonded to the element nitrogen. As we previously mentioned, phosphorus is kind of like a nitrogen derivative, only that it's more massive. If nitrogen and phosphorus were planets, nitrogen would be a smaller planet similar to a moon, and, and phosphorus would be a bigger, larger planet equivalent to almost Jupiter size, more massive and having more relative energy, but still being considered a planet nonetheless. If you think about the elements as we go down deeper into the numbers, as long as they stay in their relative groups, such as the halogens or the alkaline or the alkaline earths, we can identify the elements or classify them as simply more massive, denser versions of the same element, only more massive if they were planets, they would be more massive and they would be harder to move, with more of their net energies being locked in as mass rather than energy or motion. And that's why zinc nitrate is presented as ZnNO3 with two of those bonded to one zinc. Here we can see that it takes two molecules of nitrate to satisfy just one bond with zinc, but it takes two atoms of phosphorus to satisfy three bonds with zinc. And that has to do with the fact that nitrogen and oxygen are bound together and so they oxidize themselves previously and then whatever is left to oxidize oxidizes with the zinc. While here we have two phosphorus atoms oxidizing three zinc atoms and due to their differences in energies and net structures we need different amounts of atoms in order to create stabilities between the nets atoms in total. So phosphorus is used as an alloying agent which means it's used in the production of things such as steel. Steel is simply a combination of iron and carbon. The carbon dopes the iron bonds in order to make it more flexible and more rigid. Carbon binds to itself very easily allowing things to have structure order and form which is why a lot of plastics involve carbon and hydrogen because the carbon organizes the hydrogen and allows them to be organized and have the properties that they wouldn't otherwise have without the structure that the carbon provides in the same way that carbon allows things to have structure phosphorus also allows things to have structure that's why the body uses it for bones and it uses it for your teeth and it's used for the synthesis of various alloys for example phosphor bronze is a combination of phosphorus and tin normally bronze is a combination of tin and copper but phosphor bronze is a combination of tin and phosphorus so the thing that's replaced is the phosphorus is replaced with the copper so instead of having copper we have phosphorus with a ratio ranging from 0.01% to 0.35% and we have the tin ranging in the alloy from 0.5% to 11% effectively changing the overall properties of the material varying by percentage and varying by concentration of each element within the alloy so phosphorus is used in the production of various metals here we have a page from a book Metals are constructed in various ways, especially today. We have been using metals either in the form of pure elements or combined with other elements as alloys for thousands of years to make all sorts of useful objects, from jewelry and cutlery to bridges and spacecraft. Metals, here are the properties of metals. Phosphorus is not a metal, but it's combined with various metals, so let's learn about them. Metals are shiny. Metals have many electrons on their surface that absorb and then re-emit light, giving metals a shiny appearance. The electrons that metals possess have the ability to bounce off the energy that is projected towards them, which is why metals appear shiny in the macro scale. Everything is happening at the quantum scale, but we perceive it at the macro scale. Every phenomena that we perceive at the macro scale is all derived from the phenomena that occurs at the micro scale, at the quantum level. Metals are strong. The atoms and metals are arranged in a regular pattern and strongly bonded together. This makes metals strong. Metals have high melting points. The strong bonds between atoms in a metal mean that it takes a lot of heat to free the atoms from the metal. Metals are good conductors of heat. Electrons and metals can move freely, so when they gain heat energy they can pass it on quickly metals are good electrical conductors because electrons and metals can carry electrical charge and move freely electric currents flow through them easily metals are malleable the molecular structure of metals allows layers of atoms to slide so that the metal is malleable and can be easily shaped so the properties of metals metals tend to be strong but malleable are good conductors of heat and electricity and have high melting points however pure metals tend to be too soft or brittle to be useful so again as we were talking about they're combined with other things such as phosphorus or other very atoms on the periodic table which we will all eventually discuss copper tin iron and all those various metals require sometimes the combination or a fusion of carbon with nitrogen or phosphorus or other elements on the periodic table that give it strength and structure that on the macro scale we perceive as being a stronger metal for example let's say we have gold you could dent pure gold with just your teeth you could bite into it and you could also press into pure gold that's why in order to strengthen gold in things such as jewelry you have to combine it with other things such as titanium or 
iron or carbon or various other atoms on the periodic table that give it more rigidity structure and prevent it from being bent so easily which is why most strong types of gold jewelry that you can purchase online or in the store is normally harder or as you may notice from experience is normally more rigid than pure gold if you ever held pure gold in your hand you would be able to tell that it's pure gold simply by the softness that it possesses if it's anything stronger then it's an alloy of gold pure gold is not hard pure gold is soft so that's why again returning pure metals tend to be too soft or brittle to be useful their properties can often be improved by combining them with other elements to form alloys most metals in everyday use are alloys one of the most common being steel again steel is a combination of iron and carbon carbon is one of the elements we previously talked about if you're interested in checking out that video the link is in the description below we will eventually talk about iron iron is a very interesting element that is one of the last elements to be created in stars we will eventually talk about how the fusion of iron eventually affects the lifespan of a star and how it transitions it into its next period in life we'll talk about basic steel and various other processes but today we're talking about phosphorus so let's continue with phosphorus phosphorus as we were mentioning is important for bones and teeth our teeth contain elements such as calcium and phosphorus is a very essential element to provide structure and rigidity to it because pure metals normally aren't as strong as we would prefer them to be some metals like titanium or rhenium or tungsten are naturally strong because of their molecular structure but unfortunately we aren't always blessed or provided with the best metals by nature so we sometimes have to create alloys with the metals that we do have and we have to make them work in ways that we need them to by making them stronger with fusions of other things that we have in our environment so that's why we as human beings create alloys because believe us if we as engineers were able to just use the individual elements we would we don't waste time and energy or money creating alloys if the alloy wasn't going to prove viable in the end we need strong metal after all so if we can combine it with other things to make it stronger we will and that's why it's important for bones and teeth because phosphorus combines with the metals in our body and creates an overall net product that is stronger rigid and allows us to perform everyday functions and activities according to this article from oregon state university phosphorus is a structural component of your bones and teeth your dna and rna which is what provides the instructions and the codes for how to build you if something goes wrong in your body or something breaks down the dna has the recipe to rebuild you again or to resolve the issues that may arise throughout your lifetime if the dna gets damaged then the instructions that tell your body how to repair itself and how to reorganize itself are lost and that prevents your body from being able to become you again and that's what causes issues such as diseases or cancers in the future if the dna is damaged that's why it's important to be wary of how the dna works what it's made of what elements it consists of and how it can be improved and prevented from decay phosphorus is a structural component of cell membranes cell membranes are the outer phospholipid layers phospholipid bilayer phosphate phosphorus the phospholipid bilayer prevents things from entering and exiting as they please it creates a semi-permeable membrane in the cell here we'll draw an image that's the nucleus and this is the semi-permeable membrane that's outside the semi-permeable membrane is, is made of one part that likes water and one part that doesn't like water that much so the head of the phospholipid molecule is attracted to water and the tail of the phospholipid molecule is hydrophobic so it doesn't like water and that's why it stays within so it essentially creates this dual layer where the part of the molecule that's attracted to the fat is within the layer right here and the part of the molecule that's attracted to the water is outside of the layer that's what forms the structure of the phospholipid bilayer but that provides the structure for every cell in your body specifically animal cells that's all that there is in between the nucleus right here and the outside world of the cell phosphates come out of the blood so kidneys control the amount of phosphates in the blood and whenever we excrete urine we're excreting various molecules of phosphorus that are bounded to four other oxygen atoms which we call phosphate so the kidneys control the amount of phosphate in your blood if you have too much or too little you either excrete some or keep some based on the necessities of your body and each individual is different and varies based on the activities based on the consumption of food and based on the overall experience that they have throughout their lifetimes so phosphate groups are in dna atp and various essential proteins in the human body again the phospholipid bilayer phosphates phosphates are excreted because they're used for so many components and so many processes in the body that it only makes sense that we're excreting that because it's just the byproduct of all the energy that we're releasing if we use phosphorus in order to move
move, then eventually some of that phosphorus is going to end up outside of the world in which we exist, in which we call our bodies, which is the outside world. The literal molecule of ATP stands for athenosine triphosphate. It's literally three phosphates bound to each other. They don't like to be that close to each other. So in order to alleviate the proximity, one of them separates from the other, and that releases a huge amount of energy in the process, and the energy released is utilized by the body in order to transport things from one place to another. Transporting things from one place to another allows your body to transport molecules, allows it to transport food, allows it to remove waste and transport energy, and that's what keeps you alive overall. The fact that phosphorus is interacting in your body and moving so quickly and moving in different places, allowing your molecules to transition from point A to point B, is what allows you to be alive. So thank phosphorus for that. Again, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing, but like anything in life, phosphorus is useful, and if you go overboard with it, it can still cause harm. And we'll talk more about the harm that phosphorus can cause due to its instability and its molecular structure if it's not handled properly or if, if it's ingested in a form that is very unstable and wants to break down if it breaks down within the body then it can cause a lot of damage and that's usually what causes damage a molecule that causes damage is usually a molecule that is very unstable in its natural state or the way that you ingested it in and the reason that it causes damage is because the price that it has to pay on its journey to stability is usually your health especially if it's within you it can act essentially like a radioactive molecule and during its unstable period damage various components of the body and damage the phosphorus that already exists within so phosphorus again summary is used for maintenance and repair of the cells and tissues the rest is in tissues most of the phosphorus that is found in your body is found in your bones 85 percent in fact the percent mass that you are phosphorus 85 percent of it consists of your bone weight phosphorus is used for various things in real life it's used for pyrotechnic applications which simply means it's used for various processes that involve rapid change rapid chemical change that's why our body uses it because phosphorus provides rapid stable chemical change it's able to be stored in a relatively safe way while also being able to change relatively quickly in a way that allows us to move fast enough to be able to survive the entropy and the entropic changes that occur in the universe if we can't change or adapt quickly enough we die and that's why we don't survive if our body cannot adapt quickly enough in the environments that we're placed in if we get too cold too hot if the viruses multiply faster than our cells can multiply and defeat them then we die and that's all that life is about it's a race against entropy it's a race against time and everything that's changing around us phosphorus is able to change rapidly enough in order to keep us alive keep us away keep us energetic and keep us energized throughout life in order for us to not die 95% of the phosphorus is mined in U.S. in the form of phosphate rock. It's found in various regions. 5% of the phosphorus in U.S. is used in pure elemental form, which is very interesting. A lot of elements are usually not used in their elemental form. They're usually found in compounds or alloys, and they're usually used as those compounds in alloys. So another interesting thing about phosphorus is that black phosphorus actually organizes itself similar to the way that carbon organizes itself in the form of graphite when it's actually just naturally in the environment. So again, as we previously mentioned, with steel and metals and other things, phosphorus is used to bind to many metals to create various alloys in that same way in the same way that carbon is used to bind with various metals to create various alloys and that only makes it more interesting when we consider the fact that an allotrope of phosphorus actually looks similar to an allotrope of carbon which means that they share even closer similarities than we previously thought in terms of alloy formation not only that but also in molecule formation and molecular structure they share various molecular structures which means that they share similar energies in terms of atomic potentials in terms of atomic structures in terms of temporal energies black phosphorus organizes itself similar to the way that graphite organizes itself graphite organizes itself in this structure and that's what allows us to write so easily unlike graphite another allotrope of graphite aka carbon is diamond diamond is continuously trying to revert back into graphite which is even more interesting considering the fact that there's allotropes of carbon that are relatively unstable similar to the way that carbon is stable as a diamond form carbon stabilizes is in the form of a diamond phosphorus is unable to stabilize in the similar diamond like shape when it tries to stabilize in the form of a diamond or any other type of molecule that is relatively more stable it unfortunately fails and becomes for example white phosphorus which is a form of phosphorus that's trying to stabilize similar to the way that diamond is trying to stabilize but unfortunately the conditions on earth don't allow it to remain as stable for as long in the same way that carbon remains stable for 
longer in the form of diamond trying to revert into a similar type of molecular structure like black phosphorus only it forms into graphite that's a little difficult to wrap your head around then don't worry about it all i was saying is that the phosphorus allotropes are very similar to the carbon allotropes that exist in nature and they share very similarities properties and aspects in the macro world and in the quantum world another thing that phosphorus is used for is calcium hydride calcium hydride is the chemical compound with the formula cah2 and it is therefore a alkaline earth hydride this gray powder why if pure which is rare reacts vigorously with water liberating hydrogen gas calcium hydride cah2 is thus used as a drying agent i.e that is to say a desiccant a type of acid that forms with phosphorus that's weaker, not as strong as sulfuric acid. The formula for sulfuric acid is H2SO4, so there's two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of sulfur, and four atoms of oxygen. We previously discussed those elements in another video. If you're interested in watching those videos, the links are in the description below, or they're in my playlist in my channel if you want to check them out. The phosphoric acid that forms is way weaker because phosphorus forms a more stable bond with the oxygen bonds that it forms. So when it bonds to hydrogen, again, hydrogen is a type of metal that to the phosphate when hydrogen is bonded to the sulfate it's a little bit more strong because sulfur is more of an oxidizer along with oxygen they're both oxidizers but phosphorus is relatively more stable it stabilizes the oxidizer oxygen a little more so it prevents the hydrogen from being as oxidized as it would be in the molecule sulfuric acid because again in sulfuric acid the sulfur instead of blocking the oxygen from oxidizing the hydrogen even more it actually encourages it to oxidize it even more when we consider the fact that sulfur Sulfur is a type of oxygen, just a little bit more stable, a little bit more massive, then we can understand why it is that sulfuric acid is way more reactive than phosphoric acid, because again, phosphoric acid is more stable. The phosphate is a little bit more stable in general than the sulfate would be otherwise. And that's why it creates a relatively weaker acid. Phosphoric acid, also known as orthophosphoric acid or phosphoric 5 acid, is a weak acid with the chemical formula H3PO4. It is normally encountered as a colorless syrup of 85% concentration in water. The pure compound is a colorless solid, H3PO4. So here we have nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Phosphorus, like nitrogen, is a very essential element for things to grow because phosphorus allows things to change very quickly and things that grow change very quickly. So without them, we wouldn't be able to catalyze that change quickly. Phosphorus is the element that allows things to change quickly enough in order to be able to survive in this time period and in this region of space and time in the universe. Here we have the review of sulfuric acid, the molecule previously mentioned, H2SO4. So does have phosphate in them which is why they're kind of acidic which is why you should brush your teeth because the phosphate interacts with your teeth and causes them eventually to decay over time so be wary of that add the fluorine back into your teeth because your teeth are made of the element fluorine as well an element previously mentioned toothpaste has sodium fluoride and with the chemical reaction that takes place between the sodium fluoride and your teeth appetite that allows the fluorine to return back to your teeth and prevent them from decaying from the phosphates that are provided from the the soda that you consume. Talking about calcium hydride, here is the molecule dicalcium phosphate. Dicalcium phosphate is the molecule calcium hydride combined with the element phosphorus to form a net molecule of dicalcium phosphate. Dicalcium phosphate is the calcium phosphate with the formula CAHPO4 and it's dihydrate. Di prefix in the common name arises because the formation of the HPO4 2 negative anion involves the removal of two protons from the phosphoric acid H3PO4. The net formula again is CAHPO4. Again, primary use of phosphorus is used in the manufacture of fertilizers. And here we have the synonyms and trade names of phosphorus. Elemental phosphorus, white phosphorus, typical description, white to yellow, soft, waxy, solid, with acrid fumes in air, usually shipped or stored in water. White phosphorus is very dangerous, oxidizes with air, white phosphorus, including elemental sulfur and strong caustics. It reacts with halogens and it ignites spontaneously with moist air. Halogens, again, are the elements fluorine, chlorine, iodine, bromine, and astatine. Last but not least, phosphorus is used in everyday things such as matches. That red tip of a match is phosphorus. We'll talk more about that in detail. So we're going to go over phosphorus' history. So in the 12th century, uh, Arabian alchemists isolated the element phosphorus, but the records are unclear. It wasn't until later when an individual known as Henning Brand in the 16th century, later on, heated up around 50 buckets of his own urine and mixed them with silicon dioxide to eventually produce the element phosphorus. So that occurred 
1669, Henning Brand, a German chemist whose hobby was alchemy, he allowed 50 buckets of urine to stand until they were purified and bred worms. Technically, you don't need to do that in order to extract the phosphorus from the urine, but he himself believed that it was necessary for the phosphorus to simmer in that fashion in order to extract the phosphorus, but in reality, it was unnecessary for the urine to sit for that long and acquire all those quote-unquote worms in other parasites and bacteria that may accumulate within the urine over a period of time. So he boiled the urine down to a paste and heated it with silicon dioxide, which is sand. So here I extracted an image from a chemistry book that explains the general history of chemistry. So phosphorus, the light giver. In the 17th century, the concept of an element had been largely unchanged since the Greeks. Then one of the last alchemists made a rather startling discovery. The last alchemist, because after alchemy came real science and came the Renaissance and came people that actually used the scientific method to extract, derive, and learn about the natural world. So modern chemistry chemistry has revealed that there are around 90 naturally occurring elements on earth. For many of the most familiar such as gold, copper, or sulfur, we have no name discoverer. That changed with Henning Brand, a glassmaker, merchant, and an alchemist in Hamburg in northern Germany. By the way, that's where the name hamburger actually derived from, from that region in Germany. In 1669, he discovered phosphorus, the first named person in history to have discovered a new element. Of course, Brand had no idea that that is what he had done. Earlier figures such as Parsilius in the 1500s had pushed the idea that sulfur, mercury, and salt were primal substances that had an influential role in the formation of materials without actually being elements like earth, fire, water, and air. Robert Boyle dismissed Parsilius's convoluted theory but agreed that there must be more than four elements. Science would reveal them in time. Little is known about the life and career of Henning Brandt, so we are unsure if he was conversant with the cutting-edge arguments of the time. Whatever his scholarship, it is hard to imagine what goes through a man's mind after he has boiled a vat of urine for hours, if not days, only to find the resulting deposits, then begins to glow in the dark. He must have thought that his search for the Philosopher's Stone had come to an end with this magical white luminous substance, which he named Phosphorus Mirabilis. The Elemental Recipe Brand published his recipe for his miraculous discovery. He is thought to have used more than 1,000 liters, 36 gallons of urine to produce less than 100 grams, 3.5 ounces of phosphorus. First, he let the urine fester until it smelled suitably nasty, disgusting. Then he boiled it down to a paste, distilled off a red oil, and reduced the rest into a black porous material and a white salt. He discarded the salt, recombined the oil and spongy material, and heated them for 16 hours. He passed the fumes through water, perhaps hoping to see gold. Instead, he got phosphorus. Urine is naturally high in phosphates, which contains the element phosphorus being bound to four other oxygens. Basically, phosphorus oxidized by the element oxygen. Urine is naturally high in phosphates, compounds of phosphorus, and oxygen. Modern analysis shows that if he had used the white salt, he would have yielded much more phosphorus, and there was no need to leave the urine to go bad. Fresh ingredients were fine. As previously mentioned, he didn't need to leave the urine to fester for that long. The phosphorus already exists within the urine. The chemistry doesn't change leaving it out in that way that he did. So after he made the discovery, he wrote it down in a letter to an individual known as Gottfried William, and thereafter after, uh, there are various demonstrations of the element and its ability to glow in the dark. By the way, when he did interact with the element, he lit it up in a glass tube like this and it glue. Apart from the smell, the glowing was also incredible. So phosphorus sparked public interest mostly because it was an element that wasn't normally found in nature. At least people thought that was until people realized that phosphorus was found primarily in their bones. Phosphorus is transferred into your body when you eat things such as eggs, cottage cheese, milk, hard cheese, canned sardines and oil, pumpkin seeds, chicken, and sunflower seeds. Various other foods contain the natural element phosphorus because phosphorus lies in the ground and various things that we eat come from the ground. Actually, most things that we eat come from the ground in some form or way, whether directly or indirectly, whether through animals or whether directly through the plants. The phosphorus is extracted from the ground and we consume it. It goes into our bones and consists of 12% of the bone structure that we have throughout our lifetimes. Phosphorus gives our bones strength. It gives them structure and rigidity in the same way that the molecule adenosine triphosphate is very rigid and energetic. It allows us to move. The bones also allow us to move but in a different way thanks to the phosphorus within them. 
Apart from the elements phosphorus, our bones are also made of the elements calcium, magnesium, potassium, zinc, and copper. We will eventually discuss the elements copper, zinc, potassium, magnesium, and calcium because they're all metals on the periodic table and they consist of a lot of things here on earth and in our bodies that perform various processes and can interrupt functions or help them occur more quickly. So we will eventually cover all of those elements, but today we are discussing the element phosphorus so again going back to the phosphorus the phosphorus was mixed with silicon dioxide and a uh, white paste accumulated which was the phosphorus the molecular formula for elemental phosphorus is p4 it usually bonds like that if it's in the p4 bond then it's a very unstable structure that wants to restabilize with the environment and bond with other things and that's why we consider white phosphorus very reactive because of its high molecular instability and its reactivity with other elements on the periodic table that causes it to potentially pose a threat in, in terms of combining with elements in the body that you wouldn't want them to combine with because so many things that build us back up and reconstruct us such as our DNA consists of phosphorus it's very important that the phosphorus is not interrupted or changed and that's why if we introduce phosphorus in our bodies it can cause various changes that catalyze catastrophic situations in the future because the DNA can change and that can cause cancer. So we talked about how phosphorus is in the bones. You can extract phosphorus from bones through the addition of acids that we previously discussed in other videos. We discussed the acids nitric acid and sulfuric acid. Nitric acid consists of the elements hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Nitrogen is related to phosphorus, so it only makes sense as to why it reacts with it in such a way and is able to replace it in the bones and able to remove the phosphorus in the form of phosphate and eventually phosphorus. The other acid or molecule that interacts with the phosphorus in our bones is sulfuric acid. The molecular formula for that is H2SO4, consists of the elements hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. Basically, it's the element hydrogen oxidized by the sulfate molecule, which consists of sulfur and oxygen, similarly bonded to the way that phosphate bonds to oxygen in the form of PO4. The sulfur binds to the oxygen and reacts with the phosphorus in the bones to also extract it in the form of a phosphate which we see here the phosphate is extracted from the bones and after that we use a carbon process distilling it with charcoal and purifying it to extract the phosphorus and that's the method that we use today to extract the phosphorus and get it in its purified form all of this was done and developed in the 1800s let's talk about phosphorus and its natural occurrences on earth and in the universe Phosphorus consists of Earth's crust. Here, according to this pie chart, phosphorus consists of 0.10% of the Earth's crust. We previously talked about what the Earth's crust is mostly made of. The main element that the Earth's crust consists of is one that you wouldn't normally think of being the main element, oxygen. Oxygen is a gas and make up most of its structure and overall composition. 0.10% of the Earth's crust is phosphorus by weight. In terms of cosmic abundance, 100 atoms of silicon equate to one atom of phosphorus. Phosphorus, again, as previously mentioned, has a high chemical reactivity and reacts with various elements. On the periodic table, it's rarely found in its natural form. It can be found in its natural form in rare cases such as in meteor showers or in meteor strikes on Earth. When meteors crash onto Earth, we're able to extract the pure phosphorus that may exist within the rock itself that fell from the sky, that fell from space. There's two types of minerals, fluoroapatite and hydroxyapatite, and those two different minerals are both found in earth. Both of them are also found in your teeth. The ratio between fluoroapatite and hydroxyapatite determines whether you're going to get cavities or not. When you brush your teeth, you're actually exchanging the amount of hydroxyapatite in your teeth, which simply consists of the elements calcium, phosphorus, oxygen, and hydrogen. When you brush your teeth, you're replacing all those molecules with the new fluorine molecules and you're strengthening your teeth. This is relatively stronger and is able to resist tooth decay and the acids that the bacteria in your mouth exert that causes eventual cavities and that's why when you brush your teeth you prevent cavities because you're hardening your teeth 
turning your hydroxy appetite into floral appetite through the process of brushing your teeth. So that's why it's essential to brush your teeth because you're hardening your teeth and you're allowing them to resist the acids a little bit more. Again, fluorine is a very strong reactive element, but when it's bound to other things, it doesn't separate and forms a very tight bond being very electronegative. So that's why it's able to resist the acids. Phosphorus has been found in 550 different minerals on Earth. It's found in various compounds in various places in various regions and in various locations within the molecules that it consists of itself. So here we have the ATP molecule, which consists of three phosphates, it's appropriately named athanosine triphosphate, which in the name itself indicates that there are three phosphates attached or grouped to an athanosine molecule. And this creates a lot of tension, like a very compressed spring, and is just waiting for the energetic release of the tension. And that's what creates the energy within our body. When the energy of these three phosphates gets released, that creates a lot of energy and we're able to move, we're able to perform various functions, and we're able able to stay alive for the length of time that we do because all those chemical reactions take place not just once not just twice but various times every day every second every hour throughout the decades and throughout our lives without this chemical reaction taking place which has phosphorus and oxygen at its center nitrogen is there as well phosphorus and nitrogen are related so it's essentially the same strong molecule that keeps it together without those strong molecules we wouldn't be able to move we wouldn't be able to create molecular batteries that allow us to store energy for later use Without that, the food that we eat would just be random molecules releasing their chemical energies in random places with no direction. Here's a mineral fluorapatite. Fluorapatite as a mineral is the most common phosphate mineral. It occurs widely as an accessory mineral in igneous rocks and in calcium-rich metamorphic rocks. It commonly occurs as a detrial or diagenic mineral in sedimentary rocks and is an essential component of phosphite, phosphorite, or deposit. Is an essential component of phosphorite or deposits. Again, it's part of the appetite group. Our teeth are made of a molecule known as appetite. It's an appetite group, which is why we use fluorine in order to brush our teeth, because it's simply a stronger version of our teeth when we're brushing it. We're, when we brush your teeth, we're making our teeth a stronger version of themselves. And that should be good incentive for you and everyone else to brush their teeth every day. You strengthen yourself, you strengthen your mind throughout the day, so why not by the end of the day also go to sleep with your teeth strengthened. Since there are so many minerals that contain the element phosphorus, I'm going to make a separate video that explains what a mineral is. For now, I'll just say the definition of a mineral is a solid inorganic substance of natural occurrence, so basically nothing created it, it just occurred naturally and derives from the Earth's natural processes over time, affecting the elements and forming them and reforming them in new ways and that's what we call minerals. A mineral of phosphorus is wavelight, is an aluminum basic phosphate mineral with the formula Al3PO42OHF3 multiplied by five molecules of H2O. Distinct crystals are rare and it normally occurs as translucent green radial or spherical clusters. The crystal system is orothrombic and this consists again of the elements hydrogen, fluorine, oxygen, phosphorus, and aluminum. All of those create this rock called wave light. Another mineral of phosphorus is called viviante. Viviante is a hydrated iron phosphate mineral found in a number of geological environments. Small amounts of manganese, M2, manganese is an element, magnesium, magnesium, unlike manganese, is a different element, and calcium may substitute for iron, Fe2, in the structure. So it's usually iron phosphate. It's iron combined with phosphorus and oxygen, but it could also be replaced with the elements manganese, magnesium, or calcium because they share similar sizes and they fit the molecular puzzle piece similarly. So here are the elements that could substitute for the minerals, lead, strontium, manganese, or manganese silicates, sulfates, and vandates. So as a general summary, phosphorus discovered in 1669. As a German alchemist boiled urine to produce the mythical philosopher's stone, he discovered a glowing and very reactive material instead. He named it phosphorus. It has a number of forms. The two most common are known as red phosphorus and white phosphorus. So here we have red phosphorus. Red phosphorus is more stable than white phosphorus. This form is used in safety matches in fireworks. White phosphorus. White phosphorus needs to be stored in water because it bursts into flames when in contact 
contact with air, it can cause terrible burns. So if you're working with phosphorus or any elements in general, always be wary, always be cautious and be aware of their properties and how they can interact with other people, including yourself. That way you are able to keep everyone else and yourself safe because elements consist of everything, but you also consist of elements and some elements react with other elements. You don't want elements to be reacting with your elements because you need those elements to stay alive and have your human experience. So always be wary, cautious, and responsible with all these elements in general. This is just for educational purposes to help other people and improve their lives via science, via STEM, and technology. So that was the general overview and history of phosphorus. Let's continue. So phosphorus has five electrons in its outer shells, 15 protons in its nucleus. It's a reactive nonmetal. The reason it's a nonmetal is because it's in a transitory state between being a metal and a nonmetal. A nonmetal is simply a element that has high energy and a metal is something that is an element that has very low energy compared to the nonmetal. Since it's in the transitory states, it has both the properties of a metal and a nonmetal. Being in between, all the nonmetals share similar properties because they are in the transitory state between becoming a nonmetal and a metal. A nonmetal is usually a gas. It's invisible and it's hard to to contain. A metal is usually visible, it's very reflective and very malleable and in the environment it's easy to turn into other things. So let's continue with phosphorus and its various properties. So phosphorus here, as you can see, phosphorus is found in phosphate rock. In order to extract the phosphorus from the phosphate rock we need a process called acidulation which involves using phosphoric acid or sulfuric acid to remove the phosphorus. Again as we previously discussed in the other videos, acid is simply a metal that is super fast, having the properties of a gas but being in a liquid state. Acids are simply elements that are very energetic that are in liquid state that can recombine other elements that are in current solid states. Monohydrogen phosphate is a phosphate that is extracted from phosphorus. Usually it's extracted in the form of calcium hydrogen phosphates. Calcium hydrogen phosphates are converted from the rock into phosphoric anhydride through the process of adding sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid. When you combine that, you get phosphoric anhydride, which is simply P4O10. With the addition of water, we get the additional hydrogens added and we eventually get the phosphoric acid that we require. And with phosphoric acid, we can use it to create fertilizer or food for animals. 95% of the phosphate mine in the U.S. is used for this purpose. The other 5% is used in its elemental form. There are concerns about using phosphorus in general and mining it because increased phosphorus use will deplete the non-renewable supply of phosphate rock. So it's important to find ways to be able to create it in the future. The reason that it's so hard to create elements that are so reactive like phosphorus is because the same energy that it takes to create them is absorbed into the element once they're formed and that causes them to destabilize and form into other compounds. And that's why it's essential to find a way to separate the energy that it takes to create the element in the first place from the element itself. That way the energy that it takes to create the element is not used to reform it in the process. I know it sounds confusing, but it basically means keep the heat or the power that is used to make the element in the first place away from it once it's made so it doesn't react with the other elements. Phosphorus being similar to nitrogen in its strength and rigidity and its structure is used by the body to create these outer layers and outer structures of the DNA in order to maintain the information that the body uses to reconstruct and repair us in general. Without the structure of the DNA and its rigidity, we would be unable to reproduce and live for the length of time that we do because the DNA has all the instructions the procedures and the formulas required to recreate various things, various proteins in our body that perform various functions that then defend us from viruses or other invaders from the outside world that keep us healthy, safe, and well overall mentally and physically. Without the DNA and its structure, it would quickly destabilize and that would cause a lot of problems. If the DNA is damaged or is not structured in the way that it was originally intended, that can cause problems because the cells only follow the instructions that the DNA has and if it has incorrect instructions, they're going to create incorrect cells and they're going to cause a lot of problems that eventually lead to cancer and various other defects in the body that can be avoided easily by maintaining the structure of your DNA and assuring that you intake the right amounts of phosphorus and minerals that maintain the integrity and structure of the DNA overall. So genetics and DNA. The characteristics of a living thing, who we are and what we look like are determined by a set of instructions carried inside each of the body cells. Instructions for building the body and keeping Keeping it working properly are held in a substance called DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. The arrangement of chemical building blocks in DNA determines whether a living thing grows into an oak tree, a human being, or any other kind of organism. DNA is also copied 
whenever cells divide so that all the cells of the body carry a set of these vital genetic instructions. Half of each organism's DNA is also passed to the next generation in either male or female sex cells. And that's very important. The DNA is carried by every living thing, by everything that reproduces. It keeps it that thing. Without the DNA, there is no thing to recreate. There is nothing to reform and there is no identity of things that are. Everything else is just atoms. DNA tells atoms how to combine in the real world to form living things. So today there are many countries in the world that mine for phosphates. Large sources have also been found in Russia, Egypt, Peru, and Brazil. In 2013, it was believed that most phosphate rock mines were entirely surface mines, which are mines above the ground that use drag lines and bucket wheel excavators for obtaining large deposits of phosphorus. So phosphorus is mined from various places. Again, here are the rocks and we need a situation to remove the phosphorus from it. So if, if you are out in nature and you are collecting rocks, odds are that some of those rocks may contain phosphorus in them. So how is white phosphorus created? White phosphorus is manufactured industrially by heating phosphate rock in the presence of carbon and silica in a furnace. This produces phosphorus as a vapor which is collected underwater. We need to collect it underwater because if we don't collect it underwater under normal atmospheric pressures, it would not stabilize into white phosphorus. It would only recombine into other things. When you place something underwater, you are placing it under an infinite amount of pressure because water is incompressible. So it's at the maximum level that it can be compressed. Anything that is at the bottom of the ocean is being compressed at the maximum possible level that the air can compress it at because water pressure is infinite air pressure and when you create something underwater you're creating it under infinite air pressure virtually and that's why here's just a hypothetical formula it's not the exact formula it's calcium with phosphate and then an x which could represent a halogen that is bound to the rock itself and all of that is combined with carbon and silicon dioxide silicon dioxide silicon is a relative to carbon so it's only right that we include it in the formula because silicon is just a future colder version of carbon carbon is a more hotter energetic version of silicon so we combine all of these the phosphorus gets released eventually it will become white phosphorus which this is the formula for the calcium oxygen and the silicon will recombine in some way i'm not sure if this is the way that they'll recombine in usually the carbon combines with the oxygen from the rock and then creates carbon dioxide decreasing the overall mass of the rock eventually just leaving the calcium and the silicon maybe the calcium and the silicon combine to form calcium silicate and some of the oxygen might be left behind to form some form of new rock underwater all of this occurs and the water pressurizes the phosphorus enough for it to be able to stabilize and form the very dense energetic compound white phosphorus which consists of four elements of phosphorus all bound together into a triangle like structure again this is not the exact formula it's for demo purposes only if it's a accurate formula i'll let you guys know this is not the accurate formula it's the same thing with this this just shows the process that phosphorus undergoes in order to become phosphoric acid if nitrogen was less stable like phosphorus it too would oxidize other metals phosphorus is similar to nitrogen the reason that phosphorus doesn't stabilize like nitrogen is because nitrogen is very stable in its bond it has a triple bond which means that it doesn't like to separate from itself a triple bond is very stable and if you separate it you release a lot of energy phosphorus has less opportunities to form such stable triple bonds because of its heavier and denser structure that's why even in its white phosphorus form p4 it doesn't stay stable it needs to be formed underwater because it's more heavy it doesn't bind to itself it wants to bind in more ways and those more ways are less stable and that's why it can't stabilize like nitrogen can but if it was lighter and it was less dense it would be able to form those stable n3 like structures that nitrogen is able to obtain since phosphorus more easily oxidizes in the air it can only self oxidize under higher pressures or atmosphere such as underwater which we previously saw here with the white phosphorus in the equation to form it P4. So that was the overall summary of how phosphorus is made today overall and the commercial production and uses by other countries. So that was phosphorus explained in 50 minutes or less. If you're interested in watching the previous video, it was on Brahmin explained 36 minutes or less. Although they're similar in color, they're not similar in properties. They share the periodic table, but they don't share similar properties. The only elements that share similar properties are elements that are grouped together in the same families or periods. And phosphorus is not similar to Brahmin. So if you're interested in comparing and contrasting not just phosphorus and Brahmin, but the elements hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, sulfur, and various other elements that I made videos on. The link is in the description below. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you guys have a great day. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you guys like this video. Other than that, have a great day. See you guys in the next one.